Hello and welcome. So happy that you're joining us for this YouTube premiere. My name is Jumana Alzein Khouri and I'm the director of World Press Photo. Hi, I'm Rana Efendi and I'm the global jury chair of the World Press Photo Contest 2022. And I'm very happy to be here too. Thank you so much. We're so excited, Rena and myself, to be able to finally present to you the global winners of World Press Photo of this year. We'd like to say a huge congratulations to each of you. It's four winners and four selected photographers, and we're so thrilled to be able to announce them to the world. This is actually a small fun fact. This is the first ever photo of the year, not to include people, and it's the fifth female photo of the year winner in our history. Rena, I know that you've had many, many photos that you've had to look at, and there were lots of discussions within the jury. It was already quite tough getting to decide who the regional winners were, but it was even more tough to get to decide who the four global winners are. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yes, it was definitely a, a tough discussions and a, and a very long deliberation process. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we were very surprised to see that the, some of the themes in the global winners uh, were overarching across the various regions of the globe. For example, the stories and the photographs were interconnected. All four of these winning entries, in their own unique way, address the consequences of our humanity's rush for progress and its devastating effects on our planet. These are the kind of projects that were so important and vital that we could not uh, avoid, uh, you know, uh, paying attention, paying close attention to them. They reflected not only on the immediate urgency of the climate crisis that we're facing today, but also some of them also gave an insight into possible solutions. And also, uh, this year we introduced a new format, which is the open format. And uh, I know that the jury was... Uh, quite uh, intrigued by all the different formats that they saw throughout the whole process. And we're at the end of the day really also um, happy and, and thought that it was gave an extra layer to storytelling by being able to add different ways of telling story with the image at the center of it. What did you think? Uh, I agree with you, Jumana. I think uh, in, the, in the process we were very refreshed by this new category and uh, by the various appro creative approaches that people employed in telling stories and how nuanced they were, how instead of reinforcing cultural stereotypes, they challenged these stereotypes. And I think that was most evident, uh, especially in the open format uh, category entries. Thanks. Well, I think uh, we need to stop speaking because I would hope that everybody's really excited to be able to um, hear from the winners themselves about how the projects were made and the stories behind them. So without further ado, thank you again for joining us. And if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat. We hope you enjoy hearing from the winners and discovering these unique stories from around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. I expect a long-term project to see the commitment of a photographer over years. Presented in a way that it's not repetitive, uh, presented in a way that it engages the viewer. To be able to continue to tell a story always with different perspectives and more and more in depth. I always have a strong uh, relationship with nature and uh, I fell in love with photojournalism. 
So uh, my idea was to be a nature photographer. And after four years I was in Italy, I decided that I want to come back to Brazil because uh, here you have uh, so many things to tell. It's so huge, so uh, complex. So I decided I want to come back to Brazil to photograph my country. The Amazon exploitation model is the same since the colonial times. It didn't change a lot. In the last 15 years, what I saw, it's a perpetuation of this model. When Bolsonaro was elected, he took to the destruction of the forest to a new level. He stimulated all this criminal, like uh, illegal logging, illegal gold mining, land grabbing, and these people feel free to act. They were supported by the, the president. Most of the uh, municipalities in the Amazon, they live from illegal activities. The people from the city is completely against the law. And it's, you, you can understand that because these people are in the surviving mode. They need to work. They need to have some kind of income to keep their families. Because if you don't provide an, an option for these people, they will be a cheap labor force for these big criminals that are really making money. So it's not just an environmental problem. It's a social environmental problem. Obviously, for me, it's a huge honor to be awarded in the, in the World Press. But most important is that the World Press photo gives the opportunity to take my pictures to a global audience, to show the complexity of uh, the Amazon. In the story, we're looking for uh, for a visual narrative that is tightly edited and told from a personal angle by a photographer who is committed to the issue. I was really looking for nuanced stories and originality of storytelling. For stories that went deeper into the issues that you were about. With excellent quality, whether it's artistic, conceptual and aesthetic. Also, that the fact that you can find important or good stories in, in the back of your house sometimes, no? I started out with a love of photography um, and then that sort of changed over the years where I've focused more on storytelling um, and research behind the work, I guess. And so now I'm, you know, I'm a visual storyteller that's um, working for mostly international newspapers and magazines. This story goes back a long time. In 2008, I was living and working in Arnhem Land and I was invited to um, a bushwalk with the Nawadakan people. And that's where I met for the first time um, the people from this story and, and I learned or I saw how they were caring for their country. And so over 10 years later, I returned, this time with National Geographic, to work on a story about how the Nawadakan people strategically burning their lands to prevent destructive wildfires and how this process is, is actually helping to um, save the environment at large. The idea behind um, coal burning or strategic burning is to burn land at a very specific time where the fire will only burn very slowly and not too hot. This process um, has been practiced in Australia for, for tens of thousands of years. So one of my favorite photographs is of a young family following this line of fire. For them, fire is a part of everyday life and uh, it's not something to be feared. The people that I've photographed, I have a very strong connection with. 
Um, in fact, one of the, um, the the first photograph actually in in World Press um, is uh, a man named Conrad, and I photographed him um, you know, 13 years earlier in a very similar situation, um, walking through a fire. So it really felt like a full circle sort of moment for me um, and my career to be able to do this story. It's something that I care like very deeply about. Um, I think the work that the you Nordic know, people are doing is incredible, and there's just so much we can learn. Um, you know, it, throughout the entire country when it comes to um, preventing, you know, destructive fires um, and when it comes to caring for country. Open format is, uh, for me, you know, one of the most interesting categories to see how photojournalists can reinvent their strategies to tell the stories. The very nature of the category allows for so much creativity. The use of uh, audio and video and stills and sequencing, um, it all came together to tell this really complex and layered narrative in a very original format. I'm a visual storyteller based in Quito, Ecuador. I was very interested in the stories that are in my region, that are telling other points of view of communities. Las semillas guardan memoria cultural. Al migrar mi padre, ¿qué pasó con esa memoria? Blood is a Seed is a multimedia video that is narrated in two voices, my father's and mine, and is talking about the loss of memory and relation with seeds and the loss of agrobiodiversity. We decided to collaborate with my father and I took photos of the places he was remembering and he made these drawings about what he was remembering and what he was saying and that way we can narrate these two voices of what I was seeing there and what my father was remembering about it. Ya en Ecuador tenía un sueño recurrente. Un gran perro negro no me dejaba pasar hacia la casa de mi abuela. I think the problem of losing diversity and varieties not only is affecting us as a community because we are losing nutrients and probably some spe species will disappear completely, but it also affects how cultural memory is getting lost as well. Because this knowledge has been uh, passed from generation to generation and this is knowledge that is not usually validated by the scientific world or the Western world. So I think it's very important to um, understand how we are losing uh, this memory that is affecting us in the way we, we are living and we used to live and we want to live for the future. A single image is a standalone. You needed to have a very strong message and a very high quality. It's a very important, iconic image. A, a photo that's not only significant for the year that has passed, but that's also going to play a role on this current year.
I'm Amber Bracken. I'm a documentary and, uh, and editorial photographer based out of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Canada has a long, dark history with Indigenous people. We have attempted to erase them through a systemic practice going back, you know, about 150 years. And one of the key ways that that was done was through these residential schools. And residential schools were places where children were taken from their parents, uh, often by force, and um, subjected to, you know, physical, mental, uh, emotional, and sometimes sexual abuse. They were punished for their language, and children died there. Although we've known about this history for a long time, this past summer, the Kamloops Residential School uh, conducted a ground-penetrating radar and discovered uh, the actual unmarked grave. So we started to have, a, I suppose, a personification of some of the children that went to these schools that didn't come home. There is also these uh, little crosses by the highway, and I, I knew right away that I wanted to photograph the line of these, these crosses with these little children's clothes hanging on them to commemorate and to honor those kids and to make them visible in a way that they hadn't been for a long time. And um, just as we climbed the top of that hill, the sun kind of broke out of the clouds. So as I was photographing, Matt pointed out that the far side of the rainbow actually landed in the place where the children were discovered. So there's a, a private area behind the school that it appeared that the rainbow was, was landing there. So the whole thing felt really symbolic, um, serendipitous, and I just am so grateful for the work of the community to commemorate their children in that way. It just felt like all of those things came together in just the right way at that moment. As it happens, I'm in Rome right now um, covering a, the delegation of Indigenous representatives to meet Pope Francis. Those delegations are made up of Indigenous leaders and also of survivors. And so we have elders here who have attended those schools. And I, I happen to be in my room filing some pictures, going through some of the edits, and the phone rang from the Netherlands. and. Sure enough, I find out that that picture that's connected so deeply to this whole issue is about to get this whole brand new platform and have a whole new group of people that it can reach. So it seemed very serendipitous. It was all meant to happen like this, I think. So pretty exciting. <laughs>